And so, first of all, I should say that uh, to the extent that there are new results, etc., this is going to be not the one. And that, that we recall the setting, so GR. Which is connected to the number of the people, K on R is the maximum compact subgroup, and G and K are the complex implications. And then so far it has played no role, but we will now. You are a compact real form of G which um, contains K on R and that makes it beautiful. Now there are a few things that uh, logically I should have talked about at the end of the last lecture, that was the first lecture, but there wasn't enough time. So let me do this, and this will also remind you of uh, uh, what the purpose of all of this is. So, we call the Unitarity problem. So we want to determine when the, uh, the reducible Hirsch Chandler model can be turned uh, into a unitary representation. So first of all, I may assume that the reducible Hirsch Chandler model in question has uh, real infinitesimal power. Now I didn't explain what that means, but I shall later in this lecture. Let's just take this as uh, so far undefined term. And then suppose, uh, so that the problem of the account comes down to three subproblems. So classify the basic small by chamber modules. And the name M. And that. I will describe how one, so this is what well understood, and I will describe this in this lecture. Then B, determine which M carry a, a, a GR in a form. So now I should say that this assumption plays no role in A. Uh, it doesn't really play a role in B. However, the statement in B becomes nicer when one assumes this. And C, if so, determine what should be the form. This is So now uh, there is uh, what can really be called an observation of um, Bogen and uh, Bogen and his group, uh, mainly a real infinitesimal character. That uh, M has a non trivial U R value and U form. So U R, of course, is the algebra of that compact uh, real form. And 
in the situation, so I'm actually let me give names to the Hermitian forms with subscripts uh, U, R, G, O. So in this situation, uh, M also has a GR Hermitian form. GI and valid condition form. If and only if uh, the Cartan illusion So what is the Cartan illusion? So in this situation uh, GR or KR is a Riemannian symmetric space. Symmetric space means that there is an evolution of GR whose fixed point set is K. So that is the Cartan evolution. And the Cartan evolution uh, lives also on a complexification. It's usually denoted by theta. And so uh, when we do have a new R invariant Hermitian form, in the, in the case of real infinitesimal count, then there exists also a GR invariant Hermitian form, if and only if the Cartanian evolution lifts to, um, well, so I call this uh, Archander module script M, I will use script M for she is, uh, let me write it like this. Uh, if and only if the Cartanian uh, evolution lifts to M, and uh, if so, so we have two Hermitian forms, namely the GR invariant energy form and the UR invariant energy form. And they are simply related by applying theta to the second value. So, uh, yes. So, so, um, so again, I assume we have different decimal character, then there exists a UR in the definition form. So that's uh, this one. And if there also exists a GI in the definition form, then uh, the Cartan evolution uh, lifts to M. So, of course, what does this mean? It lifts to M compatibly with the action of the Diagonal. And um, uh, if, uh, let's say, in terms of the classification of urgency in our channel models, it's very easy to tell whether or not this is the case. So this is uh, easily checkable. And then, of course, there is an explicit relation between the two. So, what this means is that, uh, well, if you really understand the you are in the energy form, then at least in principle, you can answer the question. Yes. Now, I should explain why this was uh, important to uh, to Vulcan and to Zoom. So they were after, I mean, they wanted to find an algorithm which tells you whether or not a particular Hanachandra module is uh, uh, is utilized. And the algorithm for them means a program and you plug in the data of the useful Hanachandra module and then the uh, program works and uh, the output is yes or no. So it's really a calculation I and mean, it's not something that uh, uh, I mean, it's a calculation, it just answers is you have to say yes or no. And the reason why this statement was important to them uh, is the following. So, you know, this may seem strange, but 
if you have this uh, GR in your information form, well, if we are in the context before we have unit therapy, you can't distinguish between one that might be positive, definite, or negative. So if you have anything like an algorithm, uh, somehow the issue is up to sign. And from the point of view of, of let's say, doing actual calculations, uh, that was a serious problem. I mean, there were so ideas of what you're going to do, but there was always the issue of normalizing the emission form. So to have something positive definite rather than something negative. Now, as it turns out, there is really no natural way to a priori normalize the GR in the emission form. However, there is a way of, in an a priori manner, normalizing the UR in the emission form. Now, of course, the two are related by theta, but the action of theta on the Hadachandra model is determined only up to sign. Well, in some cases, it's, it's, it's definite, but in other cases, it's determined up, only up to sign. So somehow the ambiguity now of the sign is, uh, uh, it, it, it is really the ambiguity of extending the action of the Cartan uh, evolution to act. And so from the point of view of calculation, this is now not a problem. I mean, you have a normalization of the UR invariant one, and then the other one you get by applying data, and you know, either data. So take the wrong data, the emission form is uh, negative, no problem. And now from our point of view, our name is Harry and I, uh, you will see that the UI invariant emission form, well, you can actually write it down geometrically. And then there is no, I mean, then also from that point of view, there is a preferred choice of sign. Okay, so that is, uh, so to speak, the end of the first lecture. I don't cut me the way it. Simplicity has nothing to do with the comfort field of definition, so that makes G semi simple, and then I want to assume that G is a So, again, this really plays no role except that it will allow me to say things more, uh, more efficiently. So, now I let lambda denote H2 of X with integral coefficients. 
So that is, uh, I mean, there is no torsion, so this is a lattice. And I can think of it as sitting inside something that I would call H star, where German H is the real, is the rather the complex homology in degree 2. And then it turns out that this can be naturally identified with the Lie algebra of, uh, yes, so how should I say this, of the sign Kapan Sapu of G. So, I mean, I define the notion of a Kapan Sapu or of a complex reductive group, namely a product of C stars, which is maximum. And uh, if you look at a Cartan sample of G, it is determined up to the action of a finite group. Well, so uh, to make this in some sense rigid, namely being able to explicitly identify without ambiguity two Cartan sample groups, you need to uh, induce, uh, you need to include an additional data. And that is the data of a positive root system. Uh, you find that, but in a moment you would see uh, something that is equivalent to a choice of a positive root system. So, uh, in any case, I mean, this lambda is the lattice of algebraic uh, homomorphisms from the Cartan to C star. And then, um, for each Lambda in this lattice, there exists a unique G equivalent algebraic time number L lambda over the time. So What, I mean, what is that statement? Yes, you need such that. So if you have a line bundle, then it's, it has a church class, and the church class is simply like that. The church class of the line bundle lies in here, and it's not. So implicit in all of this uh, are some you know, remarkable properties of, uh, of the flag variety. Maybe H2 of Xz. Uh, classifies the uh, topologically topological line bundles, line bundles in the topological category. So what this says, among other things, is that uh, each line bundle in the topological category can be turned into a an algebraic line bundle in a unique manner. And not only that, when you have that line bundle, it becomes G equivalent. Maybe the action of G on the flag variety lifts to an action on the lap of the line bundle. And now, uh, and, uh, another factor in this context is there exists a role in lambda such that L sub 2 role, well, L sub minus 2 role, I should say, is the canonical role. So the canonical line bundle has a square root, and everything that I said from here down to there depends on these assumptions. You know, I mean, they can be said without these assumptions, but then the statements become more complicated. Okay, so uh, in terms of these data, I want to define P e equals C sub x. The chief, well, now I say it with less detail, so the chief of differential operators on X, so linear with algebraic coefficients, and then uh, for lambda, um, I guess uh, I should say that, uh, of course, 
was it is here in the area. So the G acts uh, on a flag variety, and of course, so it acts on the front block. And the fact that this G equivariant means, well, G acts by translation, but then the mean algebra acts by infinitesimal translation. So that means that the, so that means that the, the algebra of this algebraic group G uh, embeds into the space of global sections of Function and you can, in the element of the Lyon algebra, you can differentiate uh, in the direction of that one parameter group that the element of the Lyon algebra generates. And uh, that is then I mean, a differential operator of degree one, most broadly defined. So we have this, this is part of the datum of, uh, the, of the equivariant in chief of differential operators. And so now for lambda and lambda, I want to define the lambda to be O of L lambda minus rho. So this is the sheaf of algebraic sections of the line bundle that corresponds to the parameter lambda minus rho, minus that rho. Tensor over O with E, tensor over O with uh, with all of L minus lambda plus rho. So there are various things to be said. So first of all, what is this? So this is the chief of differential operators acting on sections of the line bundle. Well, by definition, because we have a section of the line bundle, let's say O be defined, and you have something in here, then this eats the uh, section of the line bundle that we have to and turns it into a scalar function. You will differentiate, you have a scalar function, and then uh, you tend to go back to a section of the line bundle and the minus rho. So this is the sheaf of uh, differential operators, and it acts by construction on all of lambda minus rho. And you know, you may wonder why there, there is this rho, and I will say something about that a little later. So, but in any case, then for lambda equal rho, so B sub rho is B. That's how things have been set up. And now, what is this? So, this is a sheaf of all algebras. multiplying a uh, section of this line bundle by an um, algebraic function that's a differential operator of uh, d0. And since the line bundle is equivalent, we still have an action on, on g. So we still have this. So this is still, I mean, this is still part of the structure. So there is g equivalent. And of course, uh, the line bundle locally in the touristic sense uh, can be made trivial. That's by definition of a line bundle. So that means locally, O of L, lambda, o of L sub lambda minus rho is just O. So locally, uh, e, e lambda can be identified with the rho. And to do that simply means trivializing the line bundle. Yeah, so now <coughs> there is something that I should, and there are a couple of what uh, you call the important facts. So, first of all, <coughs> So, locally, uh, O of uh, 
along the minus rho makes sense as uh, g vector value uh, line number. Not just for lambda and lambda, but for each lambda in H star. So what am I saying here? H star. Pardon? H star. Lambda is an H star. Yeah, but this is the word in the letter for H. This is H. So lambda sits inside H star. Right? So what am I saying here? So, of course, equivariance with respect to G makes no sense if I'm talking about a line bundle that's defined locally. On the other hand, if you have a line bundle that's defined, let's say, on a Zariski open set or a household open set, uh, it does make sense to ask for infinitesimal equivariance. That's what I'm saying. And the, the reason why this is true is the following, namely, locally, the lambda is E. And again, the reason that is true is that locally, the line bundle can be trivialized. And then, if you have, let's say, two open sets, and you want to compare the trivializations, <coughs> the comparison is given by a nowhere vanishing, intersection, nowhere vanishing algebraic function. And then, when you differentiate uh, what happens between the two localizations, uh, between the two trivializations, is that what it involves is the logarithmic derivative of the transition functions. And uh, let's say the logarithmic derivative of f to the alpha is again an algebraic function. Right? The derivative of f to the alpha for algebraic alpha is not the logarithmic. And so that's the reason why on the suitable open subsets uh, makes sense uh, what, do, what do I say? So it makes sense as G equivalent line bundle for each lambda again on suitable open subsets of X. <coughs> Not global, certainly. But uh, on suitably chosen open subsets, one can make sense of this. Uh, and then, of course, correspondingly, uh, yes, of course, I said already locally, so uh, I am saying it twice. And so, secondly, B sub lambda makes sense. Now, locally, As chief of algebras, and we still have this. So the line bundles make sense only locally, but the sheet of differential operators, because that involves just local, just logarithmic derivatives, that is growing. And so, again, as a sheet of algebras with this additional structure, it makes sense globally for any lambda. When lambda lies in the lattice, it's the sheet of differential operators of a line bundle. When lambda is arbitrary, well, there is no local line bundle, but the pieces of local line bundles and it acts in all of those. Does that make sense? And um, now three. So we have uh, the algebra going into here. So that means uh, so that's the algebra So that means that I can also send the and this is an embedding. But in general, you get a homomorphism from the universe of developing algebra into here, and therefore. The center of the universal developing algebra acts as an algebra of differential operator on sections of the sign bundle. And it acts on the section of the sign bundle whether or not the line bundle exists globally, in the case lambda and capital lambda, or just local. 
for any landowner of stock. So, um, the center of the University of Nelpin algebra acts on um, all around uh, this role, and now I may say this. Um, so this, this, uh, even in this setting, uh, on my account, namely, the account of my Sadama, which I uh, introduced in the first lecture. So, in the first lecture, I described it algebraically. This is a geometric way of describing it. And so, then, uh, in knowledge, a character I from CHG into C is real. So, this is the notion of real infinitesimal character. If I is a lambda, if lambda in R tensor over C with capital I. So uh, H is this, and of course that then would be uh, the dual of H lower to X to the right. Okay. okay, so those are the ingredients of the um, of the Galen's and Bernstein construction. So, I mean, the obvious question to ask is uh, what are the global sections of uh, Isadam? So this is the common term of Bernstein. So, if I look at gamma of the uh, lambda, and this is now for a lambda in h star, then this is, and uh, I don't mean this as a morphic group, I mean it is, uh, user lambda, which by definition is real g, universe and Morphine algebra, modulo g times the kernel of uh, I lambda. So of course this is the maximal ideal in CLG. So that then is a two-sided ideal and uh, I can define the sub in that way. So why do I say it is not as isomorphic to well, I have a homomorphism from G and the global sections that extends the homomorphism from U or G to the global sections, and the kernel law is precisely this. And of course, what is this? So this is um, so this acts naturally on the U or G module. With infinitesimal character yeah. So uh, an important uh, little remark is the following that of course Elanda depends depends on not lambda, but the mild orbit of lambda. Right? So this is what I explained in the first lecture, that uh, chi lambda is equal to chi nu, if and only if lambda is u and w conjugate. So the lambda depends on lambda, but nu lambda depends only on the value order. Now, I need one more definition, namely lambda in uh, so lambda 
our answer lambda is dominant if uh, lambda lies in the closure of the column stand by zero and uh, all lambda in lambda, after lambda such that uh, all lambda is ample in the sense of algebraic geometry. So uh, I think mean, so there's a notion of an ample line bundle and the uh, the ample line bundle constitute a cone in this lattice an open point in this lattice, so I want to put zero in there, and so now uh, if I take the, so if I'm in zero, then I have, uh, you know, some lattice points, and I take uh, what they span, the convex span, so I guess I think of the, the closure of the convex cone that contains all of these elements. And so, I mean, this is a definition that is wrongly correct uh, uh, heuristically. What does it mean? So, this is a real vector space. And uh, the dominant elements constitute any closed cone in this real vector space. And then, uh, lambda in uh, H star, meaning C tensor is dominant if um, the real part of lambda, the real part of lambda of course lies in here, uh, is dominant in the sense of the definition one. And finally, lambda in the H star is regular if lambda does not lie on the union of the root headplanes. Now, I don't want to define the root, uh, root hyperplanes, but for the purpose of this lecture, what matters is that, uh, so for the purposes of this lecture, I'm really only looking at lambda in the real span of capital lambda. And for any lambda of this sort, uh, a dominant regular simply means dominant and not on the boundary of regular of the uh, lambda. So uh, for lambda in here, dominant regular simply means in this dominant form of model value. Okay, so now uh, there is um, uh, okay, the following two parts. So A uh, for each element uh, of its script then in <laughs> 
So by this, I mean uh, the category of uh, sheaves over Obisa lambda, or this uh, sheaf of modules of E over D lambda. So uh, D lambda modules, which are regular homology. So, you know, in the last lecture, I, I just gave some idea of what regular holonomic means, of course, just for D modules. But P and D lambda locally, of course, look the same. So the notion of regular holonomic makes perfect sense in this more general setting. So for any uh, new in this category, lambda uh, dominant regular <laughs> implies that the uh, M is generated by a square set. And I mean, I'll say a little more about this at the government of station B, mainly so uh, again for each and in this category. Lambda dominant and lambda dominant implies that the entire all so these are in particular sheets of all modules, and this is homology in the category of uh, all modules. Is zero or zero. So why do I call these A and B? There are patterns still on A and B about Stein manifolds. So A says that on the uh, Stein manifold, any coherent sheet is generated by its global sections. So, never mind what that means technically, what it really means is lots and lots of polynomial sections. And then, uh, Kantan still B says that on the Stein manifold, any coherent sheet has no hydrophonology. So, this of course is an analog of that. And uh, notice that there are slightly different hypotheses. So for this statement, one needs uh, dominant regular. This statement holds just for lambda dominant. And of course, what does happen is that there are uh, sheaves for which uh, lambda is dominant, but not regular, which have no homomorphic sections at all. So this is the best possible statement. Now that looks like, uh, that looks like a, a pretty formal uh, statement, but then it immediately implies the following. So, gamma from this category to uh, the category of uh, finite generated lambda model. Yeah, so what am I saying here? So if we have a regular holonomic lambda module, well, its sections are surely a module over what I call user lambda. So therefore, they are user lambda. And then the yeah, regular monomic implies that what you get is finitely generated over U sub lambda. This is an equivalent of categories. Provided uh, lambda is uh, dominant regular. And uh, is equivalent to an equivalence of categories, uh, well, is equivalent to a quotient category if lambda is dominant single. So Basically, what this means is that uh, when you allow lambda to be singular, for some sheaves you have no sections at all, and uh, 
was the whole, you know, I mean, of course, there's something to be said that the connection form a category by somehow dividing out these, but uh, then the mistake becomes rare. And uh, so this is, uh, you know, may not be completely obvious, but this is a formal consequence of these two statements. Because you can write down the inverse, and the inverse is really canceling with the uh, piece of the number all of its states of globalization. Uh, quick question. Do you really need colonomics here? Uh, yes. So what about the lambda itself? Well, I mean, then, uh, it's certainly not finitely oh. uh, well, you know that thing. You know no, what am I saying? The category, the category that you're talking about is yes, just yes. lambda dominant regular. You don't need you're right, anything you're more right. because on the you're right side. Right. Right. Yes, you're absolutely right. Of course, there's the lambda itself. So, of course, A and B hold under this yes. restriction, but then the yes, category yes. on the right is too big to. It's too big, that's correct. Yes, you're right. So, so B lambda is yes, yes. absolutely right. right. You're right. Okay, so, but I mean, this is somehow the general statement of what I care about and something else, namely K acts on X with finite intervals. And so that the uh, Q in X be a particular K order. And suppose lambda is, uh, at the moment, lambda is arbitrary in uh, uh, C tensor Z lambda. And so, suppose uh, what I call old lambda minus rho. So, when I let lambda be arbitrary in here. O of lambda minus rho is this virtual line model that exists on various open sets. And so I suppose that uh, this exists on some household neighborhood. What this really means is an integrality condition on that. Of course, what this integrality condition is depends on Q. So it's an integrality condition depending on Q on lambda. So somehow this looks like a very vague statement. I mean, this exists on some possible neighborhood, but in fact, it's easy to check. You just see. You know, there's a certain ground condition that has to be satisfied. That's all. And uh, so then I let J from Q to X be the embedding, and I define script M of Q lambda to be J or star of yes. So what I'm about to write down is morally correct, technically not quite, and to give the technically correct definition would take longer than it's, it's worth, but I will say it works how it has to be modified. So I want to take uh, this um, L lambda minus rho, which exists on some house of neighborhood of Q, so I can restrict it to Q, and then what do I have? I mean, this, this is really restricted to all globally, it's just automorphic function. I mean, this is the most, the most uh, regular, most holonomic, most anything sheet. And so then you apply J over star, and so by, this, by generalities, that does lie in this, uh, in this category. So now, beyond the regular polynomial. Uh, and uh, it's now, I mean, it's easy to show just by formal geometric arguments. Ah, yes, I should say why well, this is not quite right. So, uh, if the operation of E module correct image, if you ever look at it, 
there is this long song and dance about left quadrants versus right quadrants, and it's necessitated uh, some of the geometric reasons why that has to be solved. And what this, uh, if you don't want to talk about right quadrants, as we do not in this context, uh, that means that a section and a shift by the top exterior power of the normal one. So, uh, really, what you want to apply this to is not this, but shifted by the top exterior power of the normal one, which is also in the world. So, uh, this condition is perfectly good for it. Don't want to be totally precise. Okay, so what you see by geometric arguments here easily is that this has a unique unusual suction. And let me call it I of uh, which of course also lies in this category. And why is it unique? Well, if you take the direct image from an orbit, and you know, there may be on the orbit on the boundary, there may be orbits where it can be in some sense regular. And if you take all of these possible regularity conditions, then what's left has to be reduced. That's all. So this is not the defect. And then, so, so I mean, these constructions are not, uh, are not the, uh, this and that. What's the word you just used for me? Pardon? I, I couldn't wait for the word you just used, I'm sorry. So, so these, these constructions of these two sheets are not the. And then, as a corollary of, uh, you know, of these, there are also things in birth side, we get, it was, we get a classification of uh, the irreducible uh, kernel model. So then let me call this a corollary, and it's again a corollary of this general equivalence of categories. So um, suppose Q is a category. Thank you very much. 
Come on, bro. Uh, 
cross the bar parina parin from n cross n complex conjugate. So x is an algebraic variety. Well, x bar is a complex uh, complex algebraic variety. But n bar for me is an uh, a D module for the com for the complex uh, the complex conjugate. And so appearing into the sheaf of distributions from X regarded as a real algebraic variety. And it is unique at the scale, unique at the scale. Of course, it's unique at the scaling, and, and all of this is correct only on the end is still useful. So, you know, it seems that I'm not getting anywhere, and I'm already two minutes uh, over time, but uh, we'll get to the point very quickly now. So still in this general setting, suppose omega is a smooth uh, form of property D on X divided as a real algebraic variety. Then uh, the polarization plus integration So what is the distribution? And uh, uh, I mean, I think the only, if you work on manifolds, the only reasonable definition of distribution is something that is dual to uh, compactly supported forms of property. Right. So one should think of distributions as being really generalized functions. So if you define it this way, then every C infinity function is in particular a distribution. I mean, they transform the same, same way at the coordination. So that's the meaning of, uh, of distribution that I use. And of course, this, um, yeah. So of course, what I'm saying now is uh, I'm getting myself into trouble because it's not quite correct. See, so no, it is correct. Actually, so, the way I set things up now, things will be set correctly. So the polarization plus integration against omega uh, defines a non-trivial Hermitian uh, pairing, Hermitian form H from the sections of M cross, well, so an addition pairing means, of course, bilinear pairing from this complex conjugate down to C. Well, I mean, this is purely formal. I mean, I have a, if I have uh, something in here, something in there, I apply the polarization. This gives me a global distribution, can be paired against the smooth differential form. So, Uh, so that is uh, a complex mixed part of it. Okay, so now back to the fractal variety. And so now, uh, 
you are just come back and that's kind of the link on that. So there exists the unique of the statement. Done 
that can be gotten by you know, the process of generating uh, complex mixed Hodge models, or uh, anything that is in there, um, one gets uh, a canonical conformal So let me remind you that the weight filtration is a filtration by, it's a finite length, it's a filtration by E modulus. And uh, on the uh, level of the portions of the, of the weight filtration, those objects are semi simple. So in particular, if M is irreducible, then the weight filtration just reduces to a single. There is no filtration. And uh, the Hodge filtration is by, is by uh, comparing all Hodge. So, and now uh, what this implies, and you see here, this seems to be a formal statement, but there is more quick than that, and I will explain that. So, if M is irreducible, Lambda, well, lambda, first of all, I mean, in all of this, to get these large modules, lambda has to be in the real vector space. Otherwise, uh, this, this does not work. I mean, otherwise, uh, uh, we are not in the category of uh, complex and large modules. But in the polarization, lambda has to be real in the sense. So if we're in here, if uh, lambda lies in here, and it's regular homonymic, it's regular domain, then um, we get a canonical conforial uh, K in the other uh, filtration. Finite dimensional footprints on the space of those sections. Which is the harsh Which resembles 
some property of the yeah. Uh, well, I mean, actually, so you see, all of this is. I mean, the M is infinite dimensional, the filtration is infinite dimensional. However, we have K acting. And each K type occurs one at the off. So since everything is K in memory, you can fix a particular K type, then everything is finite dimensional. So another way of saying it is that this is a polarized notch spectrum. So that is the conjecture. And now, I mean, so we are, of course, uh, working on the proof, and at the moment there is uh, uh, really only one sticking point, and uh, it is uh, shot under the right here. To make sense out of this, one needs to know that the emission form is positive, non-degenerate from the various notch frames. And I should say that, uh, you know, I mean, there is this uh, theory of mixed notch modules, and nobody, nobody, has looked at what this filtration means on the level, on the level of global section. And so for, for uh, cycle, the global sections are irrelevant. I mean, it's this uh, formal theory. And at some point I asked, and, and he, uh, I mean, he said, I have absolutely no idea. And so literally nobody has ever found any use for the filtration on the level of global section. Uh, except of course this. And so if if I mean of course in, in many cases this is correct, we would call this a conjecture otherwise. And I should also say that it may or may not be correct without the Harris Chandra structure. I mean all of this makes sense for the lambda modules. They're irreducible. So so the case of the k-type sense, but this is... Yeah, and then we don't have k-type, sure. I mean, formally, one can certainly ask whether this is true in general. Yeah. And I... So, I mean, in general, of course, to calculate examples uh, in the Brahma category, in the Chandra category, this is entirely possible. To calculate examples without that. I mean, even on P1 minus P points. And to actually calculate these filtrations, yeah, I should say this, to actually calculate these filtrations, you know, I mean, of course, in many cases one can, but sort of a general calculation, well, one can, and you shouldn't expect it. Because if you could really calculate this completely explicitly, then in principle one would have a completely explicit answer about the unitary dual. And, uh, you know, I mean, anybody who has really looked at the subject, I think the idea that uh, you can say when an irreducible harsh channel module is unitarizable in terms of the parameters, Q and lambda, uh, explicitly by some, you know, by some explicit description, this is not possible. I think everybody who's, who works in the subject has come to this conclusion. So that's why Hogan and uh, his group want an algorithm which uh, makes a computer do the work. And uh, in this situation, so the statement, of course, is relatively key. But, you know, there is no computation of what of the filtration. However, the filtration is factorial, canonical, and so one can do various things in the setting that one cannot do in terms of the representations, namely restricting to smaller sub varieties, restricting our general modules to smaller reductive subgroups in general, it's an S. If you do this geometrically, you stay in the same category. And so then you can play various games, and you know, I'm sure that one can make various statements. At the moment, we are really preoccupied with trying to prove this. I mean, there's a lot of significant machinery in this. And, uh, so I cannot say what exactly this will imply uh, because our main effort at the moment goes towards the proof.
said, and we told you that uh, so this is a nice uh, statement to talk, but how would you then um, how would you then apply it to the well, I mean, given the date. So let me. So given two and a half days. So, so, so let me give you at least some. So I said that there are various, various conclusions, conclusions, conclusions. But let me, you know, let me just say a few pretty obvious things. So first of all, um, there is this uh, Cartan evolution, and the Cartan evolution decomposes uh, the space of sections in the plus one and minus one I can say. And this, of course, also gives us uh, the composition of the space. You know, the right sum of those portions for the even and for the odd. You know, now this simply means that these two decompositions are added. That's all. And the second thing that again is pretty much on the surface is the following. So, you know, there are some representations that are obviously given there. So, uh, I mean, for example, there are the temperature reducibles, those are as a matter of fact. I mean, they are obviously, uh, they're obviously unitary, I mean, they were um, classified by uh, an algebraic uh, map. And, uh, geometrically, I would also quite clear what they are. And so for those, the filtration uh, is easily describable in the following sense. So the lowest piece, okay, um, so this filtration, of course, gives us a direct right sum decomposition. And so the lowest piece of the filtration is just the uh, lowest k part. And then for this filtration, remember the definition of good filtration, the requirement was that uh, if you try an element of order, and a differential operator of order one, you go at most one up in the filtration, but eventually exactly that. And so you can, there is a notion of complexity of filtration, namely how far you have to go before this becomes a ball. And so, of course, this, this notion of complexity makes sense both on the level of sheaf and on the, on the level of the, of the module, the half channel module. And uh, from our point of view, assuming the conjecture, obviously unitary should mean that the filtration uh, has this property from the very beginning. And this is so, this is so for temperate uh, irreducible half channel module. So, the representations that are obviously unitary from, from the point of view of representation theory are obviously unitary from the point of view of our conjecture. Then one can say more generally, uh, let's say less obviously would be to go up one level to make the uh, filtration uh, stable or two levels and you can ask you know, how far do you have to go. And of course, again from the point of view of this, uh, of this conjecture, uh, when you have to, when you have to go up, let's say, two steps. In some sense, it looks very difficult for such a high channel module to be unitary. Of course, it happens. I mean, it happens for, I mean, there's a real tension when the length of the filtration is greater than, and this complexity is greater than zero. There's a real tension. And so, among other things, this gives us a measure of the complexity of a unitary uh, representation. So, excuse me, to, uh, just trying to uh, maximize the dynamic uh, So, uh, in this equation, so, so you said that it can be unitary even if it. Uh, uh, yes, because then there is skipping of, right. of things which behaves exactly the way the skipping happens on uh, the level of the data, actually. Okay, so, so there is no exact conjecture of what is no. the no. complexity. To the unit. In other words, you could have uh, the complexity grow and still be unitary. Of course. It's difficult, but it's possible. Of course this happens. Of course this happens. I mean, all these examples. Of course it happens. Okay. But the point is that, uh, you know, when it happens, when you see these examples, you see that somehow it, it is just possible. You know? So you see how it becomes more and more difficult as the, as the level of the filtration goes up. Uh, can we come back 
with a question on the Bernie Roberts.
but I don't remember correctly, you said at the beginning that uh, this geometric construction of the UR very form uh, as a non uh, of sign. Okay, how do you see this here? Uh, because uh, the polarization, um, so, I mean, that the, yeah, I, mean, I guess the best way to say this is uh, that uh, since we know what the irreducibles are, so you see that you can have it. So, uh, you have, you know, when you restrict over lambda to the orbit, you have a line bundle on the orbit. And uh, the compact conjugate is the opposite line. So you can take the section times its complex conjugate and get something faster on the orbit. And then, of course, everything is factorial, so if you have the orbit, then you have no last And of course, I should say that uh, Bogan and his collaborators normalize it by having a positive sign on the lowest k type. And in the end, of course, this turns out exactly the same normalization because the lower level of arch equation is the lowest k type. It's the same, it's the same normalization, but here, in some sense, it tells you geometrically, well, there is real positivity. I mean, you really see positivity. It's not here. There's a very specific example of the Penrose and this Global realization of certain rather degenerate representations of uh, UPP. Does it fit into that? I do not know that as well. Because years ago they wrote down a global inner product. On um, uh, the group level. Uh, yeah, on the group level. Yeah, yeah, and then this fits into what I said before. Yeah. Right? And so I think these are really different points of view. So I was never able to explain where I showed them all this to the Penrose people until Michael Eastwood did it. That was much later. By the way, there's also the following curious, curious fact. So, you know, you might say if you have a GR in the early membrane, you can reconstruct the GR in the early membrane. And uh, the reason that this is not possible in general is there is no GR in the early form of but if you take an open G orbit and uh, there's a, let's say, uh, and if you take an open G orbit and uh, you have a compact cut for example, then you get a G on a non form of a degree on the open GR orbit. And as soon as the K orbit lies inside an open GR orbit, then you can do this directly in the GR invariant. But with the street series, for example, you can see the GR invariant in the product directly this way. But that's the only thing. What does the word polarization in the Saba sense have to do with polarization in the class of the last one? It's a sense. I mean, uh, it's a so, so the classical polarization is. Polarization is is this? But it's not not going to happen. You're, you're saying that there's, there's some theory here that, that if you need to go to where you need to sort of upscale. Yeah, the, I mean, any any integral class, H11 class, is a, a polarization in my theory. Oh, that's true. But uh, let's say when I started my first lecture, was uh, my first lecture, I said, let's fix the polarization. Yeah. So, I mean, in all of this, I, I choose a particular line bundle. I mean, at least in classical logic, here, right? yeah. you pick a particular polarization here. Yeah. And uh, so then, of course, you have a particular polarization, then everything is fixed up to scale. In this, in this context, it's slightly different because we do twisting. But again, uh, you know, you might say the polarization is in the twisted case, is involved in, again, in the lambda. So, is this in the category mixed plot 
Yes. yes. Because the dough we need is simply fixed, right? There. Yes, that's all. Thank <laughs> you.